So welcome to the virtual future stage at FutureFest 2018. My name is Steve Fuller, uh, and I'm today joined by James Hughes um, of Northeastern University, is it, or is it Trinity? Still University of Massachusetts, Boston. University of Massachusetts, Boston, okay. Um, and um, we're going to be, uh, to, before we get into what our talk is about, and just to give you a sense of who this person is, a very important person, I would say probably the lead, leading institutional person with regard to the transhumanist movement in the United States. I think that would be a fair thing to say. Uh, and certainly one of the main intellectual leaders. And for many years, you know, maybe what, 20 years, maybe more than that. Um, and, and so uh, it, it's a great pleasure and honor, actually, to be able to uh, discuss some matters uh, regarding transhumanism and the larger issues regarding the future of humanity uh, with him today. Um, but let me say a little bit first about virtual futures, which first occurred at the University of Warwick, where I am currently a professor of sociology. Um, during the mid-1990s, before I arrived actually, um, and it arose as a, at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. This was the place, by the way, I, I don't know if you know much about what Warwick was up to that, that's kind of behind this intro. The uh, accelerationism. Yeah, stuff. exactly. Yeah. yeah, a lot of that yeah. old, you know, so Nick Land was yeah. there, right? Uh, and and uh, it was a very, uh, yes, this, this sort of cyber culture. Were you part of that? No, no, see, I arrived after that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, but this was very much, very much part of what the philosophy department at the University of Warwick was about before I arrived. Um, and um, a lot of these people, as you know, went elsewhere and burnt out. Sadie Plant, she's still around. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so, but the point is that it cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. Discussions like this helped to complete the conference's aim, that is to say the original 1990s aim, of burying the 20th century and beginning to work on the 21st century. And so that's the spirit in which we're going to enter into this kind of discussion today. And you're a very apt person to do this because you have been so important at many different levels, institutional, intellectual, and so forth. And so um, one of the things that I think is very striking, um, you, you got your PhD uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and in sociology, yep. right. Uh, and um, can you just give us very briefly a sense of how, you know, given that kind of a background, you actually moved into be so central in transhumanism? Well, <clears throat> uh, the story that I tell usually starts with um, my becoming a Buddhist monk um, in Sri Lanka, then realizing that the public policy problems of the developing world were, and, and then I wasn't a Buddhist monk after that, but I was still interested in Buddhism, and uh, went to Japan to study Buddhism after that. And um, I got started to think, you know, the public policy problems of the developing world are really straightforward, and the ones that began to interest me are public policy issues of the future, the ones where left and right haven't got well-trodden paths yet. And um, so my dad was an insurance executive, called me one day and said, uh, can you find out how many uh, kidney, liver, pancreas, and heart transplants are being done in Japan? And it turned out that they had not yet adopted the brain death definition of death, which the United States started to adopt around 1978 through uh, 80. And um, it, that fascinated me, the idea that there was this uh, international discussion happening, which was changing actual practical policy, whether you take people off of ventilators or not, um, that was trying to determine whether personhood was something that happened in the brain or happened in the heart. And um, so when I got to University of Chicago in 88, my first dissertation uh, proposal was... So, okay, let, let's just, to be clear to, to the audience here, so you're becoming a Buddhist monk and then finding out about this issue about how death is defined in Japan. This occurred before you did your PhD. Yeah. Okay, that's important. I didn't know that myself. Oh, yeah. I yeah. thought it happened the other way around. But that's an important point. Okay, so, so then yeah. why did you go into sociology given that kind of background? Well, I'd studied sociology as an undergraduate. Um, actually, the reason I studied sociology is because Reagan got elected. And um, when I got to, to university, I thought that we were all gonna to have to live in post-apocalyptic communes. So the first sociology paper I ever wrote was uh, what the predictors were of the longevity of uh, a commune. And there's actually substantial research on that. But that got me hooked and, um, and I was a sociologist after that. 
But uh, when I got to Chicago, I wrote this uh, proposal to do a uh, comparative study of the fetus and the brain dead in Japanese and American law, philosophy, and religion. And uh, fortunately, that got turned down because I'd still be working on that, that thesis. But um, uh, eventually, I began to realize that both in my political world and political life, because I've always been a social democrat, democratic socialist, and also in my bioethics work that I started to do in university, um, that I was more techno-optimistic than most, than most people. And the, the kind of green, anti-machine, anti-technology biases had crept into the left and also into bioethics. The joke in bioethics was you only needed one word to be a bioethicist, and that was no, because you're just going to say no to everything. Um, and I really thought, well, if we came up with a cure to cancer, yeah, it should be universally accessible, it should be safe, but that would be a great thing if we came up with a cure for cancer. I'm not going to say no to that. So I wrote a paper in 91 uh, called The Post-Humanist Defense of Human Genetic Engineering, and I outlined what I thought were all the critiques that I had heard of uh, the idea of human genetic engineering. And I said, look, there's this new perspective out there, post-humanism. And um, I think we should be Who thinking. Who were you drawing on back then? Well, the. So you're talking about the early 1990s. Yeah, this is like 91. And um, the internet, uh, the uh, you know, web architecture was just getting going. There was already email. And I had been reading some of the extropians that were coming out of California. And these were rabid anarcho-capitalists. So, you know, I got on and, and they tolerated me for about 10 minutes until I said, well, you know, we could have universal health care. And then they're like, ah! So, um, the extropians were an example of what has continued to be the kind of um, hegemonic influence of libertarianism or anarcho-capitalism within this, this domain of ideas. I think that's an important point to sort of keep in mind. We might go back to this. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, but I was attracted to their optimism about the future and the technologies of the future, but I, I really hadn't found my home yet because they were not it. And so eventually I started a radio show, uh, Change Surf for Radio, and uh, got hooked up with the European transhumanists, who turned out to be much more Catholic with a small c in their political orientations. And that's when this uh, ball got rolling. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, now, um, one of the things that's very interesting about your particular take on, on transhumanism and posthumanism, though maybe we should start with that distinction. If yeah. there is a distinction, because I'm not so clear it's so distinct in your mind. Uh, no, it's it it's is, distinct it in my mind, but, yeah. but, but, but how do you see that? So, so we've got these, so we've got two general kind of views of how you project where we go from here as a, as a species, you might say. And, and so we've got transhumanism and posthumanism, and often they're kind of used synonymously, but, but there are people who want to self-identify more strongly as one or the other. And so what, what do you see is at stake here? Well, back when I wrote that essay, I didn't see much of a difference, but there is now quite a difference. Um, the people who describe themselves as post-humanists are mostly in the humanities, and they are mostly people who are quite critical of the Enlightenment. They're people who are interested in things like decentering the human subject and incorporating nature and animals into our political project. And, um, and the transhumanists, in some ways, are, are kind of diametrically opposite. They're the Enlightenment on steroids. You know, you take Enlightenment yes. techno-optimism, you take Enlightenment uh, individualism, and you just ramp it up and put it in the 22nd century, and that's transhumanism. Um, and so, but there are, have always been overlaps, like um, Donna Haraway's essay about uh, cyborg feminism, uh, cyborg socialist feminism. Um, back in the 80s was, uh, you know, when you read it as a transhumanist, if you can stand to read it as a transhumanist because it's written in POMO discourse, but um, when you read it as a transhumanist, she's basically saying there's no difference between technology and nature. Why are we creating these, uh, these stupid binaries? Um, let's break down that binary just like we want to break down the gender binary. And, and the transhumanists go, yeah, let's do that. Um, and then she had to backtrack when the transhumanists got a hold of it and said, oh, yeah, you're a transhumanist. No, 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 I'm not transhumanist. Well, let me ask you a question about that, because this is, this is correct. This is how I understand the history as well. Namely, if you were to look at Donna Haraway in the 1980s and you were to, as it were back then, predict where she would be today, you'd think she'd be a transhumanist in yeah. a sense, right? But she's not, right? right. Uh, in fact, she recoils from a lot of this stuff. And, and, and uh, what do you think... Because this does mark actually a very significant intellectual divide because the people who do uh, associate themselves still with Donna Haraway are posthumanists, right? Uh, and they're very anti-transhumanist and won't even talk about it, actually. Um, and, and so what, what do you think caused this kind of divide to occur? Politics. I mean, it's... 
most um, people on the left in the United States, and that would be most academics, um, uh, do not get accolades for talking about these things, about immortalism or, you know, about artificial intelligence and how it's going to make do great things for us. It's, there is a, a strong political divide, and that, that was part of my project, was I saw a long history from the Enlightenment on of left engagement with techno-optimism about how we could eventually vanquish not only authoritarianism and slavery and women's domination, but also the necessity of toil and also death, you know, that you had uh, uh, Condorcet, you know, writing about that in the wake of the French Revolution, about how we could eventually conquer death. And that kind of techno-optimism has been a part of the left. In fact, early British uh, Marxists like Haldane and sure, uh, Julian course. Huxley of course, of course, um, of course. were quite enthusiastic about use yeah. of genetic engineering. And so I think another part of the story here is eugenics, that eugenics made, you know, especially in continental Europe, but everywhere, really, the left quite suspicious of these kinds of ideas and projects. But um, so I understand the intellectual history of it, but I think we need to recapture, uh, as I say, without a vision, the people perish. You know, if you if all the left has to offer is opposition to all the things that were coming down the pike, if, you know, I, I'm going through a study group right now, reading the Communist Manifesto with my local comrades. And I'm pointing out to them, look, Marx was a fan of globalization. He yeah. was a fan of capitalism. Of he was a fan of technology. He was not a Luddite. He never said that you should smash the machine. He said you should control the machine yes. and take power through the machine. All of that's true. <laughs> right. No, no, all that's true. But let me, let me put a point to you. Namely that um, I think the difference between the transhumanists and the posthumanists um, is the issue of, of attitude toward risk. Okay, so somebody like Donna Haraway, even back in the 1980s, was talking about nervous laughter and not knowing what to make of the fact that we, have, we could have these hybrid beings and so forth. In other words, there's always been a kind of fear associated with uncertainty about how the future may turn out, no matter you know, how optimistic we may be in the first instance. Whereas with transhumanists, it seems to me that they treat risk very much uh, like entrepreneurs do, as opportunities. Right, that we should go for it, right, as it were, and then suffer the losses and do something as a result and behind it. So I think there's a kind of one of the things that I think has happened, and I think things like the climate change issue and you know, a lot of these issues nowadays where where And where, by the way, Steve's written a whole book about this topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Risk no, and no, 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 no. For action or imperative. No. Because I do think one of the things that we're trying to get at here is that there are these two different attitudes toward risk if you're talking about, because at the end of the day, we're talking about, you know, when we talk about risk, we're talking about attitudes toward the future. And you can either see the future as an opportunity or as a, as a source of threat, right? Because there's uncertainty in either case, right? No one's going to be able to predict the future perfectly, right? And, and, and so the question is, if we're going to go, you know, and do something really drastic and we're really going to transform things and we're going to, you know, in the way transhumanists often talk about, right, we're in a way jacking up the risk. There's no doubt about it, right? But the question is, is that a good or bad thing? Well, are, okay, so just rewind on that. Are we jacking up the risk or are we simply trying to lay out the scenarios of the things that could happen? Yeah. I, I think there's a huge problem in this futurist, transhumanist milieu of people who don't take seriously uh, negative risk. Exactly, I agree with you. Um, but no, the, no, I agree but, with you. But then people who only take seriously the negative risks are equally a problem. So, we, you know, if, the, if we can get the futurist, uh, with a lot, people in general, to pay attention to the fact that, yes, robots could go Terminator and there's certain things that we can do proactively, proactionarily to make sure we don't end up in a Terminator scenario and try to shift things into the, you know, mana from heaven yes. scenario. No, no. See, that's, I think, a, that's a really good point to bring up because I think that there's a sense in which... Um, we, you know, if you look at a lot of the transhumanist stuff, especially the stuff, you know, as you characterized earlier as anarcho-libertarian, which is actually kind of where a lot of the soul of the stuff is, you might say. Um, Ayn Rand kind of on steroids. There's a little bit of, there's something of that kind going on there, right? Uh, those well, people... Doug Rushkoff just wrote an excellent essay about how all the libertarian transhumanists are building their own bunkers to, you know, with yeah, their I know, I know, robot I know, guards I know, I know, to prepare know, for the know, coming know. apocalypse. No, no, I know, I know. <laughs> I think it's really, it's, it's almost disgraceful. But, but, but you know, because you should put your money where your mouth is, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you think that, that the future is going to be so wonderful by doing all these drastic things, you should try to 
cover your ass so easily, you know. <laughs> but but the point is, I think that th this is this is a really uh, a good point, namely that that the, the transhumanist rhetoric is is kind of relentlessly optimistic, right? It doesn't talk about the negative sides, and 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 in particular, it doesn't talk about what you would do about the negative sides, right? Because because there there's a kind of a sum, and this is where the whole you might say libertarian free market mentality becomes very diabolical in transhumanism because basically uh, what part of the subtext is everyone will bear the burden themselves and some people will be able to bear it better than others right like right. the guys who can who can get those bunkers going they'll bear it fine right right if they make some mistakes and if the world comes to an end because of stuff they've done but then everybody else is going to be you know <laughs> dead yes yeah, so, uh, some combination of techno solutionism it's like well if we have a problem with you know nano warfare we just have to invent the nano shield and then we don't worry about the politics of it. it's like you know weapons of mass destruction are an ongoing issue we have fought many wars about weapons of mass destruction in the last couple decades right it's a major cause of global insecurity yeah Yes, it's going to be a problem when we have bioweapons labs that are the size of this room that are completely undetectable, that will be able to wreak as much havoc as a nuclear weapon. We have to figure out what to do about that. And if you think the only thing you're going to figure out what to do about that is come up with the super vaccine, instead of having a political solution, a geo-military political solution, then you're absolutely living in a fantasy land. That's, that's exactly right. And, and this points to the, the, the sort of larger, you might say, intellectual gap within contemporary transhumanism with regard to think, being able to think in a sophisticated way politically, right? Because it's all for the, I mean, transhumanists tend to be the magic bullet people, right? That we're going to cure aging and boom, somehow everyone will get it. We're not going to worry about how that happens. We're yeah, not because everyone worry. has access to healthcare now, right? Right. So everyone's going to get everything, right? It's just going to have to be out there, right? So as long as you got the magic bullet, everything will happen. And so that's why you, you get this kind of Blind faith and trickle-down economics, basically, what it, what it boils down to in practice. And, and so from a political standpoint, this is completely unfeasible. I think we all realize that uh, for, for all kinds of reasons, right? Uh, not least because of the complexities of the world in which we live. But it is equally wrong for the left to come along and say you're just a bunch of individualist wankers. No, right? because I, I agree with you 100%. Because That's you didn't say that about H, you know, HIV uh, drugs, right? And when HIV drugs were first invented in the early 90s in the United States, 40 grand a year. And no one said, why are you spending 40 grand a year on these rich white men when you should be spending on bed nets in Africa? No one said that. We tried to figure out how to get those drugs cheaper so everybody get them in their hands. We, we launched an international political campaign to make sure that uh, we could make those drugs if the companies didn't sell them cheaper. And eventually we got them cheaper. And that's exactly what's going to happen with every one of the things that transhumanists want. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I agree. I, 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 at least I hope that's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of sharing your fantasy in this regard. I mean, I think things will probably be a lot messier than that. But uh, uh, I mean, and I think this is where it does move to an issue, uh, which, which we talked. I mean, I was in the session yesterday morning, um, which started this whole business, which had to do with the the, the future of, of health and welfare, um, and then the question becomes, uh, you know, to what extent. Do you want people, can you trust people to actually make decisions with regard to these matters themselves? In other words, can these kinds of decisions about the long-term, you know, health care of people, uh, even in the first world, I mean, can they be left to democratic processes? Can, you know, so if you were to throw open the National Health Service, let's say, in terms of the pri how to do priorities, right? Because this is, I think, going to be an issue that's going to, because, you know, we're running out of money, where people don't want to be taxed too much. So there's going to be a sense in which the issue of how you prioritize health care in the future is going to become a major deal. And so then the question is, okay, what should be the decision-making body to determine the priorities? And um, would you leave it to a vote? Or would you have experts do it on behalf of the people? I think that's going to be, because it seems to me that the issue of where democracy figures in all this is a very important point. And what, what's your view about that? Well, we're in a weird situation in the United States because we don't have a universal health care system. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, and so it's up to 1,500 insurance companies and state policies and things like that. But, but so suppose you did, right? Suppose, yeah. suppose you do already have a national health service, but it's one that's going to be under very serious revision in the future, especially with regard to priorities in terms of what should be universally available, right? That's going to be the issue. Well, in Citizen Cyborg, I flogged the idea, an idea that had actually come out of the Clinton health care reform proposal in the early 90s, 
that you could have um, a state-sponsored voucher system and people could buy into different private health insurance plans. Okay. So you could have a, a transhumanist uh, health insurance plan that didn't give you anything for keeping people who were you know, terminally ill alive, but gave you a lot to freeze them. Right? You could freeze them and wake them up later. Um, and then a Catholic health plan where you didn't have any abortion or contraception and you had uh, more end-of-life care, whatever. I, I flogged that idea. I thought it would be egalitarian if you had a universal voucher system. I still think it could be egalitarian. I actually got invited by the Swedish Social Democrats and the Swedish Libertarians or Liberals um, both th think tanks thought that my ideas fit into their camp. So um, I... That's a good idea, actually. Yeah, I, I, I still think it could work. But now in the United States, there's a lot of momentum behind Medicare for all, just expanding our Medicare system for the elderly to include everybody. Let me ask you a question. I mean, but I want to go back to your voucher system because I think that's a really good idea. Yeah. Um, it would be especially a good idea if there is a kind of uh, transparent accountability. So in other words, we see the consequences of people going down these various voucher routes, mm -hmm. okay, in terms of, you know, life And expect that was part of the Clinton proposal. Yeah, yeah. And, and so in other words, this would also be used as a kind of experimental testing ground. Right. For, and I take it that is part of the intention of, of, of having this kind of plurality going on. Exactly. It's not just choice. It's also a learning mechanism. Yeah, and it wasn't that I, d I thought one would demonstrably be better. It would be better on different value systems. Different sure. Different ones would be for different Well, values. no, exactly. And, and I think it would be useful for people who, let's say, hold a different value system to see the consequences of what the other value system does when it makes decisions on but, these matters. But just rolling it back to what most countries have, in every country, with every new technology, there has to be a decision. Is it cheap and effective enough to make it accessible to everybody, in which case it should be covered in a national health service or whatever? Um, if it's not, um, should it be available through the private market? That is, is it safe enough but too expensive for you know, some question? Is it cosmetic and not really therapeutic, things like this? Just um, sit down. It, <laughs> sit down, please. But You're yeah. blocking the camera. <laughs> That's okay. but, the, but the interesting question that always gets raised with transhumanist proposals of longevity therapies and things like that, or cognitive enhancement, is we should ban that outright, right? People, their knee-jerk reaction is to ban it outright. I'm like, well, under what circumstances do we ban things? You know, maybe it's not safe enough or cheap enough to be made accessible through a universal healthcare system yet. But what, on what grounds do we ban things in the private marketplace? They're when they pose a fundamental threat to the egalitarian assumptions of our society, right? We don't do that with private education, at least not in our society. Uh, no system in Western society has banned private medicine, to, that, to my knowledge. Now, my example of where um, it would trip that wire for me is like if cognitive enhancement cost a million dollars a year and it made you a million times smarter, right? If it, and we also have to step back and say, some technologies already do that, right? If you have a supercomputer, if you own Google, you can spy on everyone in the United States, everyone around the world, right? And you can control and manipulate governments through Facebook. And so, so there are technologies which pose these kinds of questions. But just take it to the medical context. If there was a pill that could make you a million times smarter and made you a super villain kind of creature, yeah, that's, I would be for banning that, right? Until we could figure out what to do about it. But right now we're talking about, you know, maybe you know, a little bit of performance enhancement. And I don't think that you know, if we decide we're not going to have it in the universal healthcare system, I don't think that a little bit of performance enhancement, a little bit of extra longevity is such a threat to the egalitarian assumption. Okay, let me, let me ask you a question about the villain stuff, because uh, it seems to me that the, the villainy um, works generally when it's kind of scarce, right? So in other words, if you've got only a few or one person that can actually wreak a lot of damage on a lot of people, then obviously there's a problem of the kind you're talking about. But if you were having a system where there would, that whenever an enhancement actually kind of came on board and was already seen as having some kind of effect, which I, I take it you're presupposing, right? You wouldn't, know, you wouldn't know that a particular drug causes villainy unless it actually did it, <laughs> right? I mean, um, that you would then basically universalize it. And in that case, then the amount of villainy that would be caused would be minimized, and in fact, the interactive effects of various villainous people, you know, checking each other would maybe, in fact, lead to some kind of collective intellectual ende endeavor, right? So, so to, you know, because... I mean, maybe, I mean... Uh, so, you know, so if you have, I mean, in a way, what I'm talking about here is kind of a high-tech version of a very classical kind of view of, 
Human beings are self-interested bastards, but the point is they have to interact with each other, and it's through that interaction that they, in fact, become better. So if you learned at the beginning that people are self-interested bastards, you would just stop them altogether from existing. Let me throw one more thing on the table, and that's the gun control debate, I think, is very instructive in the United States. Uh, at, well, gun control everywhere is instructive because what would a, an enhancement look like if it was like a gun? You know, I used to be very sympathetic with the X-Men narrative, that the X-Men were these poor, tortured mutants who were being hunted down by bad governments. But if you had a neighbor who could actually just look at your house and blow it up with his eyes, <laughs> I think you'd want to know about that, right? And I think we probably would want to have some licensure and maybe some government regulation about who could have those kinds of powers and, and what circumstances they could use them, right? They wouldn't just be able to put on a costume and run around and decide who they, which criminals they were going to abduct. So I think there are certain enhancements that we could imagine putting in a regulatory framework where you only could use it if you had licensure. Yeah, but see, okay, um, but the, yes, I, I guess I, I agree with that. But I mean, I get. I mean, I don't want to get too much for those of you who aren't familiar with the the American Constitution. The the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which actually allows people the right to bear arms, uh, is theoretically. Well, right, right. Uh, was in a well-regulated militia, but right, anyway. but 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 it was originally meant as a complement of the First Amendment, which is the right to free expression. Okay, so in other words, you can't have one without the other. You can't, you know, in a sense, feel free to be able to express yourself unless you also have the freedom to defend yourself. I, I think that's kind of the logic of having those two things next to each other in the beginning of the Bill of Rights of the United States. And I think that's and if you read people like John Milton and all these early defenders of freedom of expression. They definitely believe in this idea, right? I mean, they definitely believe in this kind of idea that's enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. And, 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 but the point about it, I would say, is that it was meant to be universal. So if everyone knows that you have a right to free expression and you know you've got the power to defend yourself, then people will, def will, will behave. That's, I think, the, the, that is the original intention. And that is, in fact, from the standpoint of the Americans who today Defend, defend it. The yes. Second that's Amendment. What they say. That's exactly what their argument is, right? They're and demonstrably that is kind of the original wrong. Idea. Demonstrably wrong. No, no. I'm at, <laughs> but, well, why is it wrong? The point is, why is it wrong? Because the gun ownership of the United States is the principal predictor of whether your kid shoots his. No, no. Sibling I understand and, the empirical facts, but why is the principle wrong? I mean, there might be empirical reasons why, well, in some sense, what 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 was intended has not been actualized, but in fact. Those who have the universal right of free expression, why can't they have the universal right to free defense, self-defense? I have libertarian tendencies, but I have never been a state abolitionist. And there are state abolitionists on the left in the United States. You know, there are people who want to abolish police. But if police, the state required that people prisons. had to learn how to fire a gun, I get I don't want to go down this too far. Yeah. But the point is, if you actually, just like you, you, you have people required to be educated so they can express themselves in the most articulate way fashion, and that is the point of universal education, so you can actually defend yourself verbally, why shouldn't you also require that they be able to defend themselves well, in terms of that. Okay, so rewind. Most human enhancements that we're talking about never will pose these kinds of questions, right? Well. Uh, cognitive enhancement um, and longevity. Longevity is not something that is a threat to the safety of other people. But um, if there were technologies, yes, I would. Can I just rewind? Since you mentioned the Constitution, and behind us it says non-human personhood was the topic of the conversation, um, we may just, in the next year or so, see the erosion of abortion rights in the United yes, States. Yes, that's true. And one of the things I've argued about the transhumanist agenda is that the first biopolitical fight um, was the fight over abortion, because it really turned into a fight about personhood. It was a, a bio, uh, you know, you could say that slavery raised some of the same issues because, you know, are African Americans persons in the same way, uh, if the gender struggles in the same way. But really, this, you know, is this embryo, is a cell, could a cell be a human being with personhood rights? And I think that issue is now becoming increasingly complex. Just this last week, there was a paper published about what do we do with brain organoids, literally brains yeah. that were growing in petri dishes, yeah, right? Yeah. Is it, do they have rights? What, how, we, we, for 15 years, we've been able to put human uh, neural uh, genes in different animal models, into mice, into primates, and so forth. And so the question there has been how how much human cognition can you put into an animal before it begins to have human rights? Or does anyone uh, want to give uh, an animal with human rights, even if it can sit down with us and have this conversation with us, would people still say, no, no, you're, you're still a chimpanzee, you can't have human rights? 
that is, I think, what um, one of the most fundamental political issues posed by transhumanist technologies, because humans are going to become increasingly different, animals are going to become yes. increasingly blurred into the human realm, I and machines it. are going to become increasingly human. That's a good point, yeah. And in all these domains, we have to figure that out. So what for you, okay, I actually I agree with you 100%, and I've been told we, on, we only have five minutes or less on well, this Well, it's we touched on it. No, 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 but, 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 <laughs> but the thing is, when we talk about so how much is riding actually on the word human here? Because if we talk about personhood, which is kind of what you were focusing on just now, and you're saying, well, you know, uh, you know, we, we've got the, the human stuff can be put to animals, and then we'll be merging with machines in various ways. All these things are going to happen. And I agree with you. I actually agree with you on all those points and as an empirical phenomenon. Then we're, um, in, in, in a sense, if we're concerned about ethics and politics and normative issues more generally, what is the concept that we should be focusing on? Should it be the human or should it be the person? I mean, in other words, you know, to, to guide our intuitions as to what to yeah. make about, because you're talking about giving rights to things, right? And the thing is, what, what are the entities we're talking about? Are we talking about things that are sufficient, that meet a certain standard that they, we can call them human? Or is it some sort of ab more abstract notion of person? I mean, what, what, are, what are you going after here? Right. Well, my argument has always been that the Enlightenment was the was when we began to tease apart the notion that all humans are, per, are persons and all persons are human, um, and the practical application of that is abortion. Obviously, fetal tissue, embryonic tissue is human in some sense, but it can, we can also say from an, uh, a phenomenological point of view, from a psychological point of view, it has not achieved personhood yet. The brain death debate at the other end of life is the other teasing apart, where you say, yes, you were a person, and then you became permanently unconscious. Your heart's still beating, your body's still there, but you're not there anymore. You, the real you that matters, Right, so you anymore. can be a human in terms of homo sapiens, because that's how we would identify you from a physical, biological standpoint, but you're no longer a person because you don't have the, the mental functioning. Exactly. I see. Okay. And, and so if we focus on that mental functioning, then we have to say, well, which characteristics of this human mental functioning do we really think are important? Because we're going to be able to do all possible variations of minds when we get into the machine realm, right? And we also probably see it already with the different kinds of brain damage that we see with people. If you're a, someone who can't remember anything after 10 seconds, it is narrative memory, is the ability to remember your life over time an important part of being a person? We haven't just summarily executed any of those people, thank God, but um, I, I, you know, I think we could create a machine that was able to function as if it was human, but would actually be a philosophical zombie. It wouldn't have any narrative memory. And in fact, that's what's being explored in the TV show Westworld. It's right. like they, they acted to all intents and purposes as, as people, but at the end of the day, they lose everything. And it was only when they begin to have narrative memory that they become persons. And so I think those are the kinds of questions we really have to figure out because we're gonna to have to define it in law. We're gonna to have to determine who gets to vote. It's gonna have real important yes. practical consequences. So do you imagine, I mean, and, and, and this is gonna be the last question before we end, uh, do you imagine that in the process of this, in the future, that some people who are homo sapiens will be disenfranchised? Well, that's certainly the right to life argument already, that the embryo has been disenfranchised and they have then applied it as well to the end of life and then arguing that there's a culture of death, that we're taking rights away from human beings. I would argue that we're in fact focusing on what's important about being alive and being a human and not uh, just fetishizing tissue because fetishizing, t you know, one of, the, one of the implications of the Catholic position is now we're able to take any cell from our body and turn it into a, a, a totipotent cell. And, and create uh, gametes out of it. Does that mean that if I take two cells out of my tissue and turn it into an embryo, that every cell in my body is now uh, sacred, right? Every cell in my body is a potential person. What's the implications of that? So I, I think we have, and we're gonna also have artificial wombs. When we have artificial wombs, this, the Roe v. Wade was already gonna fall apart because it was predicated on the notion of viability. Viability is gonna fall apart. We're pushing it farther and further back with neonatal intensive care. We're pushing it farther and farther up with in vitro fertilization. Eventually, we're gonna have artificial wombs and you're gonna have a baby, uh, you know, something growing in a tube and you're gonna to have to say, at one point, can I just flush this down the drain? At what point I can't? Okay, well, look, I'm gonna, we're going to have to end here. I mean, it's too bad that uh, we didn't discuss more about the religion aspect of this because you've just brought up what I think is a very interesting suggestion, <laughs> just to put it in the minds of people here, about why you're a Buddhist, uh, because, That's right. right, as opposed to a Christian, because what he's suggesting, if you've picked it up, is that Christians, in a sense, are fetishizing the material. 
That's right? right. Right? The Catholic Church in particular. God became flesh. The Catholic Church in particular is fetishizing the material. God became flesh and they told us how to have sex. Yes. Okay. Well, we can't actually discuss that here, but this is actually <laughs> kind of what I was hoping we would get to at some point in the discussion. So, um, first of all, I want to thank you so much, thank you. Uh, James. Uh, we really just, uh, you know, just sort of touch the surface of what's going on. And so I'm going to end on this prayer that we have here at Virtual Futures, which is, I want to end with this reminder for those interested in the future. Some things that may seem imminent or inevitable may never actually happen. Though I actually think most of the stuff we were talking about will happen. Um, <laughs> fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not contingent on our capacity for prediction. Although sometimes, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable comes of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you're, you feel you've done that today. Please join me in thanking the incredible James Hughes. And the incredible Steve Foley. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>